Moses. Moses. Your father's called me God. And I. I have made you an orphan of grace. I have sustained you in the house of the king. Now see your purpose. For I have heard the cries of my people. I have seen the weight of their oppression. And I have come down to deliver them. And I will stretch out my hand against Egypt and guide my people to a land I have prepared. I will make you my mouthpiece. I will make you a shadow of one greater to come. I will lead you as I have led you. Now go! And you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Yo, friends and fam, so great to see you guys in the room, in the building uh, today. For those of you watching online, we wish you were here, but thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we'd love for you to come crash the party in person sometime soon. Let me do a, a quick poll here. Don't be too cool for school. Everybody participate. Raise your hand if you can name all ten of the Ten Commandments. Quick show of hands. Okay. Let me bring somebody up on stage real <laughs> A lot of hands went down. Okay. Yeah, man. Well, listen, if, if, uh, if you cannot see, for me, if it was true or false or multiple choice, I could do it. But like fill in the blank, I don't know if I could do that or not, especially not in the, in the probably in the correct order. Uh, so if you kept your hand down, you are actually not alone. Uh, because in, in 2017, a survey came out uh, that only 14% of Americans can name all of the Ten Commandments. Only 14%. Now that, you know, that sounds kind of interesting right there, uh, but it sounds even worse when you find out what the majority of Americans do know. Uh, for example, 25% of all Americans can name the seven ingredients in a Big Mac. <laughs> That's a problem um, to all beef patties. 33% uh, of Americans can name the name of all three stooges. <laughs> That means twice as many Americans know the names of the Three Stooges than they do the Ten Commandments. That's uh, crazy. 35% of Americans can name every kid off of the Brady Bunch family. That's a show that was canceled before I was alive. And uh, for some reason, everybody knows all of those, all of those kids, but, but not the Ten Commandments. More Americans know sesame seed bun and special sauce than they know do not murder people. Uh, that might come back and bite us sometime soon. Uh, I, you know, honestly, though, I bet Jesus realized that not a lot of people would remember the Ten Commandments. Uh, because when he was hanging out with his disciples, he said, look, guys, I, I know what was on the tablets. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of it, okay? Ten is hard, but two might be a little bit easier. So let me give you the summary. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so he gave them kind of the condensed... If you didn't read the book, here's how to pass the test. Here's how, to, here's how to make an A on the quiz. Just know those two. I think even Moses knew that majority of the people that he was talking to would not remember the Ten Commandments because he actually had to give the Israelites the Ten Commandments twice. He gave it to them in Exodus chapter 20, the chapter we're going to look at today. But he gave it to the Israelites again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. This was an entire generation later, right before they go into the promised land, Moses realized... You people have forgotten everything. And so again, he goes over the Ten Commandments with them. Now, anytime you see something repeated in Scripture, you know that's important, that's significant, that's a big deal. But, but when you have ten things repeated twice, that's God's way of saying, hey, I, I want to get your attention. You really need to, to really dial into this and pay, pay attention to this. So today, I want to walk through the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. If you have your Bible, you can pull it up. The words will be on the screen or if you have the Revo app, you can download that. All of the notes and the breakdown will be in the, the sermon notes section up there. Um, but instead of just going through the commandments one by one and just trying to get you to memorize them and kind of like learn these things, I, I want to show you some themes. I want to show you some truths that, that I believe God, some principles that God was trying to outline when he laid out these ten rules, the ten commands, and, and put the parameters. My goal for you today... Um, is to change what you think when you hear the phrase, the Ten Commandments. 
When, when I say Ten Commandments, maybe some of you think about the movie, the big white-haired dude with the two stone tablets coming down the mountain. Maybe that's what you think of. When you hear Ten Commandments, maybe you think of rules. This is just God trying to tell me not to have any fun in life and uh, just trying to hold me down. Uh, may, maybe you think of, for some of you, you may think of the Ten Commandments as, this is what I have to do to impress God and make it to heaven, right? These are the rules. As long as you obey the rules, then you punch your ticket in. And so I, out of all of those things, I, I want to show you some things that, that I believe God is trying to teach us when he established these, these Ten Commandments. So if you're taking notes today, I want you to jot these three things down. Three principles that we can learn from these Ten Commandments, one of the most popular passages in, in, in all of Scripture. The first principle, as we look at Exodus chapter 20, the first principle to learn is this. Jot this down. It's the principle of perspective. The principle of perspective. I think God is trying to change our perspective on some things when he gave Moses these rules to give to the people. Here, here's how verse uh, 1 starts in chapter 20. Then God gave the people all these instructions. Here's how he starts it out. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. Now, now that's like the introduction, right? So a lot of people, when they think of the Ten Commandments, they're like, okay, that's the prologue. Like, let's get all the introduction stuff out of the way. We know who you are. You meet us. I meet you. I'm God. I'm getting ready to talk to you. So, like, let's just get to the meat of it. Let's just get to the top ten list right here that God is going to give us. But, but God actually makes a huge statement there in verse 1 and 2 that I think if you'll, if you'll grasp that, like don't skip this, it'll totally change your perspective on the rules and the parameters that God has given us in the Ten Commandments. Here's what God said. He said, I am the Lord your God, the one that rescued you out of slavery in Egypt. You used to be a slave, but because of me, I gave you freedom so now I'm going to share some things that will keep you free. That's a totally change of perspective because when most people think of rules, they think not freedom, not this is going to be great for me, that they think, oh, these are going to hold me down. The, the fun is gone now that there are rules. There, there are things that I have to do and God is making me do these things. I think this, this idea of rules is especially hard for us as Americans uh, because just the side effect of living in the home of the free and the, the, the land of the free and the home of the brave is we don't want anybody telling us what to do. Like no one tells us what we can and cannot do. And one of the ways that that really kind of flared up in the past year is COVID. Right? Man, we don't like anybody to tell us what to do. If you look back at the season of COVID, there were some good rules uh, there were some bad rules, and there were some, like, head-scratching rules. Um, I don't know if you remember the first rule that the CDC came out with, um, but, but when COVID became a thing, the CDC said, the first thing that we, the, the, the government, want to tell the American people is wash your hands. I was embarrassed that that had to be established as a rule right there. <laughs> it's like, we're leading the world. Hey, people, wash your hands. I feel like that should be, like, you don't have to say that. You, you shouldn't have to say that out loud. Now, listen, I, you, you may have known this about me. I've shared stories about this. I was team hand sanitizer way before any of y'all joined the party, okay? Like, I love, like, cleanliness. Like, it, it, like I, I take a shower in the morning. I take a shower most nights. And depending on how rough the day is, I might take one in the middle of the day, too. Like, I just, I love to wash my hands. I love hand sanitizer. I got it in my car, in my office at the house, like everywhere, like I, I, I love it. I'm, I, here's, a, here's a weird fact about me. If I go into a public restroom, I will wash my hands before and after I use the restroom. Like some of y'all don't even, don't even wash it after, please. Like, come on people, join team cleanliness, right? But like even me, like I touch the doorknob, I'm like, I gotta wash these hands right here. Like who knows who touched that doorknob right there? And so, like, that, that was a rule that was like, hey, praise God, somebody finally said, hey, people, wash your hands, right? Like, have clean hands. Uh, but then there was also some, some rules that really didn't make sense. Um, uh, for some reason, when we talk about essential workers and non-essential workers, uh, when COVID hit and quarantine happened, restaurants that served food could open, but bars that didn't serve food had to remain closed. It, it's almost like, so if you're serving food, COVID is like, you know what, I'm going to stay away from there, I'm not going to go in there, 
But if you're a coffee shop or a bar, like, you're asking for it. Like, you're cruising for a COVID bruising if you go into there. And so that was a rule. And I, and I saw a, a story on the news uh, of a guy in New York uh, that owned a bar, and he found a loophole. Um, the, the, the rule there in New York was if you don't serve food, listen to this, that's prepared in-house, then you are a non-essential uh, establishment and you can't open. So here's what this guy did. He went to Costco and he bought these number 10 cans of nacho cheese. And he bought a microwave and he bought huge boxes of tortilla chips. And he added one thing to his menu. And because he cooked the cheese in the restaurant, it was a loophole for him to be able to open up and the government couldn't do anything about it. Like, that's the, like if, if you can get your way around a rule by microwaving nacho cheese, like, it's a bad rule. Like, it's just a loophole that, like, you really need to, to think through that. But I think, ultimately, rules get a, a bad rap for us. We automatically think that they're here to squish us down, to limit our freedoms. But see, God provides a different perspective with rules. God says, you were a slave, but if you will follow these rules... You'll never go back to slavery again. These rules, these parameters, these guardrails that I'm about to give you are actually going to give you freedom. I was running downtown the other day, and uh, there's a dog park uh, near uh, Winston-Salem State University, and I was walking by, and I was just observing people, the dog owners, that bring their dogs to the dog park. And so here's how it happens. They park their car in the parking lot, and the dog is on a six-foot leash. And the dog is really excited because the dog knows he is going to the dog park. And so he's jerking the chain and the leash, and the owner's pulling him back. And, like, he can just, like, he's choking the dog. And, like, the dog's really excited. But something interesting happened when the dog got inside of the fenced-in dog park. The owner bent down and took the six-foot leash off, and the dog could run free dog starts running laps around the whole park, sniffing inappropriately all the other dogs that are in the dog park, using the bathroom, wherever it wants to go, running, jumping, rolling, barking, like having the time of its life. Now, how did that dog experience so much freedom? Because it played within the parameters of the fence. Outside of the fence, the dog had no freedom. Six foot leash, the, the, the owner yanking it back. But when that dog was inside the rules, inside the parameters, it actually led to more freedom. Now, I'm not saying all rules are like this, but I can tell you this about God's rules. God says, if you will understand the parameters, the guardrails, the rules that I'm establishing for you, and you live by them, then you will experience freedom. A lot more freedom than you would have if you decided to operate outside of it. So God starts it out, says, even before I tell you the rules, listen, I rescued you from slavery so that you will never have to go back. So understand that what I'm getting ready to tell you is actually going to lead to your freedom. God says, I need for you to change your perspective when you think of the word rules from something that keeps you down to something that actually provides for your freedom and your satisfaction and your enjoyment in your relationship with God. The second thing, number one, the principles uh, that, that God wants us to have this change your perspective. But the second one is priorities, the principle of priorities. This is really why God lays out the first four commandments. He wants to challenge us on what our real priorities are in life. Verse three says this, uh, you must not have any other God but me. First and foremost, God says this, when it comes to me and you, I am number one. Nothing else takes priority over, over your life except me. No one else has authority in your life except God. So when it comes to what is right and wrong, it's not what you think, it's not what the group thinks, it's what God thinks. When it comes to the authority, how we spend our time, how we invest our resources, the relationships that we have, what we do, how we treat people, the attitudes and our actions, God starts out by saying this, like the, the, the authority comes from God. Number one, is there anything in your life that is more important than God? Is there anyone that you listen to that takes precedence over God? 
Is there anything that you read here in Scripture that you're like, you know what, that's what God says, but actually I'm going to do something totally different. God says, where are your priorities in this? And here's why this is so important. If you don't grasp the first commandment, then you might as well throw the other nine commandments away. Because if God is not first, then someone else will decide what is right and wrong. When it comes to murder or idolatry or um, lying or coveting or stealing, all of these other things, like if God's not number one, then all those rules are up to you. So God says, first of all, prioritize me. What are your priorities in life? And if it's God, then the rest of the nine will fall into place. If you grasp the first one, then the nine makes sense. The interpretation is not just up for whoever wants to decide and whatever they want to talk about, but we acknowledge right here, all right, God, I'm going to trust that the, the, the parameters that you lay out are actually going to help me. And it's going to be beneficial for my life. Verse, verse 4, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens, on the earth, or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Now, for some people, like for us in this room, that might be a throwaway. Because I don't know if you have a little gold statue in your closet with candles around it that you bow down to every night. I don't know if you have like a wooden bowl with a face carved in it that, that you say your prayers to or that, that you offer sacrifices to in your den. I, like, so when we read that, we might think, oh, well, you know, this is not for us. It doesn't have anything to do with us. I don't have any graven images. I don't have any like gold statues that I'm secretly worshiping that, that no one else has. And so what it, what it actually shows for us is this. Is there anyone or anything in your life that is more important than God? Anything or anyone in your life that is more important for God? And God says, if there is, then that's a problem. And for us, I'm not talking about golden statues or graven uh, images made out of wood. Anything in our lives can become an idol. If it takes precedence over God. Here's, here's one idea. Um, when God gives us his word and the commands in scripture, and he's very clear on what we're called to do and what is right and wrong in our lives, if we choose something else over that, then we're essentially looking at God and saying, you are not my God, I get to decide. So who's your idol? You are. God says, don't put anything above me. Don't make anything more important than me. Some people worship fame. They worship success. They worship money. They worship pleasure. These can become idols. These are things that become more important to us than God. And what comes in your life, your finances, even, even great things like your family can become an idol. Your relationships can become an idol. Pleasure can become an idol the moment that it becomes more important in your life than God. So there's the big question. What are your priorities? When God gave those first two commandments, he was looking at us and say, let's figure out what matters the most in your life, what you really care about the most. Verse 7, uh, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Now, you may think of this and say, well, that's an easy one. That just means don't say, oh, my God, or if you hit your thumb with a hammer, don't yell out, Jesus Christ, that hurt, or anything like that. The problem with that is um, the text for us today cannot mean something that it didn't mean to the original audience. And those phrases didn't even exist when God laid these out. So there has to be something more than just saying the name of God in a slang term. Here's one of the truths that I think God was laying out in this particular command. It also means that if you claim to be a Christian, Christian means little Christ. If you claim to be a follower of God and your life doesn't line up with your words and your actions, then you are misrepresenting the name of God. If we're Christians, we, what we are claiming is how I talk, how I spend my money, how I spend my time, what my calendar looks like. Everything about my life is how Jesus would have lived his life because I am a little Christian. I'm made in the image of God. And so if your life doesn't line up with God, God, what God called and commanded you to do, then we are misusing, we're misrepresenting the name of Jesus in our community. If what you say 
and what you do does not line up together, then we've got a mix up in our priorities. So God says, man, don't, don't take my name in vain. Like, don't go out here and say you're on my team and my family, a Christian, love God, and then live your way in such a way that would tell the community that you don't care about God, that you don't love God. What you say and what you do is determined by your priorities. Now, here's an interesting one in verse 8. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Four verses of the Ten Commandments were dedicated to keeping the Sabbath day holy. That's more than the back half of the Ten Commandments combined. Just in the term of words, it's amazing to me that God spends more time talking about honoring God through the Sabbath than he does about killing other people. <laughs> Thou shalt not murder is like four or five words. Four verses on honoring God and making God a top priority by keeping the Sabbath. What does that say? What God says here is we're going to find out what your priorities are when it comes to your time when it comes to your schedule, when it comes to what matters most. If you don't keep the Sabbath, let's say you, you work on, on Sunday instead of worshiping, instead of gathering, instead of being together and elevating God's name, then you're essentially saying, God, my top priority is not you, it's work. I'll, I'll go on the other end. Some people, they'll stay at home, like, yeah, you know what, like, we're just going to stay at home today, we're just going to sleep in and maybe, maybe do breakfast in bed, maybe have some fun with the kids today, we're just going to take, take a me day then in essence what we're doing is we're looking at God and saying pleasure is more of a priority to me, God, than you are. And so God says, here's, here's where your, your priorities are going to get tested. Once a week, are you going to be willing to come in and worship, make much of the name of Jesus, come into a room and encourage other people, like enjoy community and prove to yourself, to your family, to your boss, to your neighbors, to your friends, and to God that God is the top priority in your life. God says, man, just go hard for six days a week, but one of those days, make sure you honor God. What's interesting about the, the, the commandment uh, of honoring the Sabbath is this is one of the only commandments that Christians will brag about breaking. I mean, we, we love to tell people how hard we work. And like it's a badge of honor, right? When you, when you meet somebody and they're like, what'd you do this week? Man, just grind 80 hours. Worked 80 hours this week. Just grind it out. You're like, oh, yeah, great, awesome, man. Keep pushing, provide for your family, make that paper, like do it. Congratulations, man. Promotion coming your way. And even as Christians, we're like, you know, even, even if I have to work, instead of honoring God, I'm, I'd, I'd be willing to do that. Even if I can stay at home and just kind of take a chill day, instead of prioritizing God with the first day of my week, then I'm willing to do that. God says, hey, we're going to find out what your true priorities are really are. Will you choose God over everything else? Will you prioritize him even with the first day of the week saying, God, I'm going to start this week worshiping you, gathering in your name. If it's not a priority in our lives, then we will choose every other thing to do on a Sunday except for worshiping God. Third thing is this. Once you get your right perspective and once you establish what your real priorities are in life, then finally we see the principle of practice. God says, when you get those first four commandments right in the little intro section, let me just give you some examples of what this is going to look like, right? Let's just give you some practical examples, everyday stuff. Maybe you got some questions on what it means to make God a priority or to have the right perspective when it comes to rules. Uh, see, God knows that what you believe determines what you do. Right? Everything that you do in your life is a, is a stem from what you actually believe in your mind and your heart. And so God says, let's, let's, let's prove it by what you actually do with your, with your life. Verse, verse 12, honor your father and your mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. 
Honoring your father and your mother takes humility. Anytime you honor and show respect to someone, you are elevating them above yourself. And so God says, hey, let's, let's see these priorities take place when you show humility in your life and honor towards others. Your relationship that you have with your earthly parents also shows what you believe your relationship with your heavenly father should look like. And so just like we honor God and respect him, then we also honor our parents here on earth. God says, let's see. Let's see what it looks like. Let's put it into practice. Uh, verse 13, you must not murder. Four words. Like, you must not murder. Sabbath was like 25 words. <laughs> murder. Do not murder. You must not murder. Here's the deal. We have to understand that if God values life and God values all life, then as followers of Jesus, we have to value life as well. And obviously murder is you not valuing someone's life. So if your priority is God, if he's the one that says what is right or wrong, then we get behind him and says, God, if you value life, then so do I, and so I am not going to commit murder. I'm not going to kill anyone. Another truth that we find from scripture when it comes to murder is people that, that murder were often trying to get vengeance for someone that did something wrong. Well, what about when the Bible says that vengeance belongs to the Lord? That you and I would be willing to say, you know what? I can't control what other people do, and I'm going to trust that God is going to work out the details. He's going to be the one that judges people in the end. I've got to believe that that's who God is, that payback belongs to the Lord, that vengeance is not mine, that I'm not going to take those things into my own hands. Chapter, or verse 14, you must not commit adultery. Hey, like Moses, tell people don't, don't be sleeping with somebody else's husband or wife. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, this is a throwback to what God said in Genesis that this one man and this one woman would have one marriage for one lifetime. Well, the problem is when we mix those priorities up and say what God said about marriage and what he said about relationships is not right, here's what we turn it into. Well, well maybe we can have one man and two women. Maybe as a husband I can have a wife and I can have a side piece. She gets it. And God says, no, 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 that's, that's not what I said. No, 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 that, that's not how I outlined it. That, that's, no, that's not, that's not marriage. That's adultery. Or maybe it throws around to the girl. It's like, yeah, yeah, I can have one girl but two guys. She can be my husband, and then I can have a boy toy. Just, you know, just a little something to enjoy. A little, little arm candy, no big deal, right? And God says, no, let, like, <laughs> you got to understand it. When, when you prioritize God first, you understand that the rule about you only having one spouse is actually really beneficial for you. Because the reality is if you ask people that have gotten a divorce as a result of adultery, you'll hear stories of pain and heartache. And you'll hear stories of families that got torn apart. And you'll hear regret. And you hear families even to this day who, who can't reconcile. And God says, listen, I know, man, I, I, if you'll just do it my way, I'm telling you there's so much joy in it. There's so much freedom in it. I, I don't know anybody that committed adultery that was like, man, I'm glad I did that. <laughs> that really worked out in my favor. God says, I've actually put some parameters around this, put some rules around it, because I know this is what's going to bring you joy and satisfaction and happiness in your life. Like, you don't understand how great it is when, when a couple is dedicated to one another and you have trust and, and, and intimacy is high. And man, this is just how I've created. Would you just trust me? And God said, the way you're going to do that, the way that plays out is you're just going to make the commitment that you're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to mess with what God set up as his way that people can enjoy relationships. God says, stay within the parameters that I've set, and, and I'm going to help you avoid so much heartbreak. I'm going to help you avoid like, this collateral damage that happens when people live outside of the boundaries that I've placed. Not because not I want to hold you down, but because I want you to experience true freedom in your relationships. Verse 15, you must not steal. Well, why does that matter? Because stealing shows jealousy. If somebody else has something that you don't have, you get jealous of it, so what do you do? You take it. The opposite of that would be God looking at you and saying, why don't you trust me that the things that you need in your life will be provided by God? 
It's the opposite of that. Like, don't steal it. Just trust if you don't have it, then God can provide it or will provide it or God's protecting you from something. Don't take it into your own hands. That's a practice. When God is your top priority, when you love him and trust him, then you won't get jealous of what other people have and you won't want to go and steal it. That's how it plays out, the practice in our life. Don't, don't lie. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor, verse 16. Here's what happens when you're a liar. Nobody likes you. Nobody trusts you. You lose relationships. Nobody wants to be around you. Like, I don't want to hang out with people that don't tell the truth. You, you don't know what they're saying. You don't know what they're saying about you when you're not around. And so it breaks trust with people. Like, if you're known as a liar and you, you lose your character and integrity, then, like, nobody's going to hire you for a job. Nobody's going to want to be your friend. Nobody's going to want to marry you. No, nobody's going to want to talk to you. No one's going to want to open up to you. God says, man, I got this plan for your life where you get to enjoy people and be in community. And, I, and I've got things that, that, that you can have if you're a, a person of integrity and character. But, but if you're just a liar, then, like, you're going to blow all that. You're going to miss out on so much that I have for your life. It's not a parameter. It's not like a, a rule where you're like, oh, man, God's really coming down hard on me. Like, no, I got a plan, and it's going to be awesome. If you just understand what these rules are, if you just understand why there's a fence built around your mouth when it comes to your honesty and your integrity and how you, you treat other people. Over time, someone that doesn't tell the truth loses their influence, loses their relationships, and instead of being in community, they're completely isolated where no one wants to be around them. Is that the life you want to live? Well, then be a man or a woman of your word. Last verse, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, or, or a donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Here's what happens when we look at what other people have and we covet it we begin to be bitter because they have something that we don't have. And the thought goes through our mind, well, they shouldn't have it. They don't deserve it. I do. And where are you, God? Like, why didn't you give me what they have? Why doesn't everybody have the same stuff? H how is it that they can have something and, and I'm still asking for it? So we begin to covet those things to the point where we become bitter or angry or resent people that have stuff that we don't have. In contrast, you can look in the book of Galatians, and Paul talks about a community where we can celebrate each other. Hey, man, a win for you is a win for me. Praise God. Like, God provided. God did something in your life. God gave you a child. God gave you a new house. God got you a promotion. Like, you're enjoying things in your life. Great. I want to celebrate it with you. I ain't going to hate on you. What God did for you, man, that's great. See the dynamic change between that? I don't like you because you have stuff that I don't have versus, man, praise God that he's doing some things in your life. That's great. Man, that's awesome. I'm your number one fan. I'm cheering you on, celebrating with you. You see what happens when the perspective changes your priorities and then your priorities end up changing your practices? Everything changes in life. Another uh, set of rules uh, that, that have a bad rap uh, our homeowners association rules. Now, you know, some people complain about, man, it, I, like you, you can't do certain things and, and you have to do certain things. And like if your grass is like, like some homeowners, like they have an inch on their grass that you can be like, if your grass is over like two and a half inches, you get a fine. And I don't know who's out there measuring that, uh, but somebody is, somebody's watching for you to do the right thing. Um, and, and like if your house isn't kept up or there's only certain places you can park your cars, uh, like you can't park your cars on the street and you have to park them in your driveway or you, you have to keep your trash cans out of sight where no one can see them. And, and within 24 hours of the trash being picked up, you have to roll your cart back. And, and a lot of people like get frustrated at HOA rules. You know a group of people that, that don't get mad at HOA rules? People that used to live in neighborhoods that didn't have HOA rules. Like if you've ever lived in a neighborhood where like you're driving down the road and, and like y there's a house, just a random house where the grass is like two feet tall. And you, you drive by people's homes with vinyl siding and mold and mildew cover the outside of the vinyl siding. And you got cars that they don't work, they've been broken down for, for years now and they're just sitting in the yard, they're sitting on the road, they're sitting in the driveway and home repairs need to be made and like every time you drive by the house it's like an eyesore. You know what happens if you live in a neighborhood like that? 
eventually over time, the value of everything you have goes down. But you know the cool thing about a neighborhood with HOA rules? Everything is neat and clean and orderly, and it's safer. And as a result of those parameters that have been put into place, everything you have increases in value. And I think about how that relates to the the guidelines, the parameters that God has set for us. And I think the Ten Commandments just scream out this message that, hey, if you'll make the right priority to be God and let nothing be more important than Him, let let God be your foundation. If you will will do that and have some principles in your life and, and let that play out, then I'm telling you, your marriage, your family, your friends, your relationships, your job, your finances, All of it increases in value. You get more satisfaction out of it by doing it God's way. You're like the dog who gets unleashed inside the fence. Like they're just just enjoying life as it is. And then the moment that you decide that your way is better, that you don't like the rules anymore, the moment you step outside of the fence, you don't even realize it, but the leash goes back on. And you have very limited freedom. And the world gets to pull you around and tell you what you can and can't do and the directions that you have to take. What would it look like today if we changed our perspective on the Ten Commandments and looked at them as a way that God looks down at us and says, I've got a plan and a purpose for your life. You used to be a slave to sin, but now you have freedom in Christ. Let me show you how to stay free and enjoy the life that I have for you. Wouldn't that be great? (laughs) That's a great alternative. I choose freedom over slavery every day. And God says, embrace the parameters, and that's exactly what you'll have in your life. Can I pray for you? God, forgive us when we uh, look at the rules as a way that you're trying to rob us of some kind of fun. As you being a, a boss that just wants to tell us what to do, just wants to hold us down. God, those are the types of things that you rescued us from, from being a a slave to religion and having to jump through the hoops and trying to earn our way to you, that, that you would actually give us the freedom of having a real relationship with you, the freedom of salvation that we can receive by making a decision to follow you, and, and that you would even be so kind as to show us the parameters that would allow us to enjoy our lives to the fullest to experience the maximum amount of freedom that would lead to joy and happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment and purpose. God, you were so kind when you laid these out. I pray that we would change our perspective when we thought about the rules, the guardrails that you've placed out in front of us, that we would see them not as things that slow us down, but actually things that accelerate our lives to be able to enjoy what you have so graciously given us, to never go back to being a slave of sin again, but to experience true and eternal life through your son, Jesus. It's in his name I pray.